is a big unit. This is a very chunky unit. This unit is probably going to be the basis of everything you do in nursing. Okay, this is your assessment unit. And everything we do is based on assessment. And you're going to learn that when Ms. Walker talks about nursing process. <coughs> assessment is the beginning of the nursing process. So this is a very chunky, chunky unit. Um, I have got, I use a lot of pictures in my stuff. So the first thing is visual aids. I don't know if you saw that. If you are a visual learner, those are really neat. If you pull those up. They, they, they look a lot like this. Okay, the, the gingerbread is on the front. Um, I'll explain the gingerbread a little bit later, but there's a lot of pictures in here, so these are really good. Um, there's a blank outline. If you like blank outlines, you can use that. Some people would rather use that than a PowerPoint, so you don't have to. Reading assignments, I took the outline from your syllabus and I tried to put where you would find each topic. I don't know if you saw that or not. So where you're going to read from, most of the stuff is going to come from your uh, Kosher and Herb book, the fundamentals book. But you can also refer to your concepts book for some of this stuff. So look at that. Um, and then there are two web enhanced assignments. I spelled assignment wrong. I just noticed. I'm just going to ignore that for a moment. Okay. There's one that's due on the 29th. It is about fluid electrolytes and nutrition. If you click on it, I want to make sure everybody understood this. If you click on it, there's part one, which is nutrition. There's a little PowerPoint just to refresh your memory about nutrition and how to calculate your BMI if you really want to know. A lot of us don't want to know. That is. And then the second part of it, is fluid and electrolytes. Now, I will be doing fluid and electrolyte imbalances next semester. Fluid and electrolyte and acid base imbalances next semester. So for right now, I just want you to look at the basic balance part of it. What if, and some of this stuff you should know from anatomy and physiology. Okay, so that's your fluid and electrolytes. Okay. All right, the next thing, let's go back to the You are going to be doing a nutritional assessment with Miss uh, Beaver and some of the other instructors, I believe, Thursday, sometime soon. One of these days that I'm in clinical, so it's either this Thursday or the next Thursday. So you're going to be doing that with her um, as, as part of the nutrition, as part of the assessment process. And then the second thing is due right before your test. It's comfort, pain, and sleep. That one's due the 17th. Now, this one, these, the first one only has two PowerPoints for you to look at. The second one does have a PowerPoint, but there also is a little quiz, My Baby is in Pain. This actually is in your Prentice Hall Custom Case Study Book. Everybody get a case study book? Mm -hmm. It was recommended. It was white. Does it have, should it have growing embarrassing college on it? Okay. What I do, because I'm really big into saving trees, I'm really trying really hard to make sure I'm not handing out a lot of handouts this year. So I have taken, you need still need that case study because you need to read it. So the questions on that case study I've made into a multiple choice little quiz instead of long, drawn out answers. So that's what this is, is a uh, little quiz to take. Okay. And then there is a uh, article on um, pain assessment in people with dementia. And I want you to write your answers down and we'll go over them together in class. All right. This is the PowerPoints. I went ahead and gave you the PowerPoints for this unit. They are just the slide. Whatever I talk about, the notes section, it shouldn't be there. You should just have the slides. So um, you can add to. Um, I use PowerPoint slides as a guide. There's going to be a lot of stuff that I say that's not on those slides. So you still need to write out beside the slides or underneath or however you want to do that. Okay? But a lot of people like to have the slides beforehand. 
All right, so any questions about this? Now, we will be doing some hands-on stuff as well in this unit. So as we, let's see, tomorrow, I want you to bring your stethoscopes to class and your pin lights. So stethoscopes and pin lights. So hopefully you have both of those tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, Wednesday. All my days are running together. And so from here to the end of the unit, I need for you to be to bring a, your stethoscopes and pin lights because we're going to be doing the skills that we're talking about. We're actually going to be doing on each other in class. Okay. Has everybody got that? Okay, any questions? Okay. I always start my classes off. Um, today we're kind of we're getting started halfway through, but I always start my classes off with housekeeping. Mm -hmm. So if there's any housekeeping information that you want to talk about, any questions, anything you're you're confused about, anything that has nothing to do with class, but you want to ask it, you know, about the program or whatever, that's what that time of day is for. So at the very beginning of class, we'll have a housekeeping session and kind of clean house, make sure everybody's on the same page. Okay? Any questions before we get started? Your minds are just kind of, y'all just have this blank stare on your face for a second, so <laughs> minds are kind of blown. All right, well, before we get started, speaking of that, I'm going to pass out one of my favorite things, and you're going to keep this. I want you to keep this because um, you're going to need this when I do acid base balance, too. Now, not, not a lot of the other instructors are going to know it. They know what this is, but they don't use it. So I'm really the only one who uses this, but I think it's really an important piece of thing. It's an important thing. Um, this is a deer in headlights. Okay? This is what you're going to feel like on occasion as we're talking, as we're lecturing. Do not laugh at my deer. I drew him several years ago, but I think he's cute, right? You see how big his eyes are? It's yellow, because that's, that's the headlight. Okay, so everybody take a deer in headlight. If you get confused, or you're concerned, or you have absolutely no clue what we are talking about, hold up your deer in headlights. Okay. <laughs> and we will stop, and we will kind of regroup, okay? Keep your deer in headlights so that next semester when I do include the electrolyte balance, because that stuff is very confusing, you will have your deer in headlights, you can use it. Okay? Again, I cannot guarantee you that any other instructor is going to have a clue what to do with that if you hold it up. So really, you just kind of need to save it to someone else. Okay? Alright, so everybody should get a deer. Alright. Any questions before we get started? Oh yeah, anybody, you can record me. I usually don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, well let's talk about physical assessment. This is probably, this is actually what a lot of people associate nursing with. Did you get, a, were you excited when you got your stethoscope and you wanted to do something with it? And it's, you know, everybody gets that stethoscope and you're like, oh, I can do something. You know, I feel like a nurse, you know, with a stethoscope. And, but you really don't know what you're doing with it. So now we're going to figure out what to do with it. Um, so here we go. Holistic health assessment. Here's my little things that work. Ms. Chandler used the tiny one. This one's one I used all summer. I think it's dead. She's the little white one. She was dead, huh? It was summer. Yeah, I think that's working. I like this one. It's soft. Okay. So the purpose of the exam, and I walk a lot, so I hope that doesn't distract people, but I hate standing behind a podium. So um, I walk back and forth and up and down and around and all that stuff. Plus, I like to see what's on your computer screens because <laughs> a lot of you are um, not looking at what we're talking about. Okay, so the purpose of the exam. The first thing that we're doing is we are gathering a health history. We want to know all about our patient, all about our client. This is when we get our baseline data. How are they before we see them or before uh, they are admitted to the hospital or when we are admitting them? What is that baseline? Because we're constantly referring back to that beginning exam. Every shift, 
Every nurse is going to do their own assessment, and it may change. Okay, so are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Are we making no progress at all? Right? You also want to make sure that you have their history because how does it contribute to what their current problem is? For example, if you've got a patient that's a diabetic, okay, those, those people who are diabetics, their bodies do not heal as quickly as someone who doesn't have diabetes. So if they come into you with a, um, maybe they had surgery, Maybe, they, maybe you're admitting them post-op and they've had surgery. You know that if they have a history of diabetes, that you're going to have to take extra precautions with their surgical wound because it's not going to heal as quickly. So those history, that health history is extremely important. The exam is also going to help to, you to develop nursing diagnoses, and that's something you're going to learn more with Ms. Walker, how to develop a nursing diagnosis those are going to guide your care. There may not be an actual problem at this time. If you're doing this assessment in an office, for example, it's a well visit, okay? They may have at-risk problems, and you're going to learn all about at-risk and actual problems with this walker, okay? One thing I want you to know about the exam is, again, that it's ongoing. It's constantly ongoing. Okay? It's a fluid process. When you hear something referred to as fluid, that means that it's constantly changing. It's constantly ongoing. When you're doing an exam, you're developing goals for your patient, goals for your care of your patient. And if something doesn't work, then what are you going to do? You're going to go back, you're going to reevaluate, and you're going to change your plan, and you're going to do something different. So the exam is extremely, extremely important. The last thing I want to point out, too, is this areas for health promotion and disease prevention. What are some ways that you can teach them how to take care of themselves? If you're doing a health assessment on someone and you're asking questions about how often do they go to the doctor for a well physical, and they say, oh, I'll hardly ever go, then that's an area that you can teach them. So you're planning your education as well with these people. Okay? All right. One thing that you're going to know, know by the end of, your progr of this program that's extremely important to me is cultural awareness. I'm very big on culture. I think that if we are truly in this country a melting pot, then we need to recognize that there are people from other cultures and, and countries and religions that we are going to be taken care of. All right, And we have to be able to respect that culture. When I was working this past weekend, I had a um, newborn who was admitted for a temperature problem, and they were from India. And the grandmother was there. She, in that culture, the grandmother takes care of that child for, for quite a while, while that mother is healing and getting better. The mother doesn't really do much of anything. And the grandmother, beautiful woman, she had a sari, the whole, the whole flowing robe and a little dot on her head. She didn't speak any English, but she was it was just beautiful. They had a little necklace around his little <laughs> neck and it was supposed to keep the nightmares away. And just a neat, neat culture. And you need to make sure that you respect where these people come from. Our job is not to judge them. Our job is to take care of them. Never once do we ask when they come into the hospital on our floor, especially on pediatrics, um, do you have your citizenship? Are you actually supposed to be here? It doesn't matter. We are responsible for caring for them when they are under our care. Okay, so be very careful and avoid stereotypes. Um, there are some cultures who have a higher frequency of um, abnormalities such as Navajo Indians have a lot of ear abnormalities. But that doesn't mean that every Navajo Indian that you come in contact with will have an ear abnormality. That's just more common in that culture. Not every African American has sickle cell disease. Right, Lakeisha? Correct. Correct. 
So just because they're African American does not mean that they have sickle cell disease. So please be careful to avoid stereotypes. It's very, very important that um, we, we are very cautious about that. Okay? All right. Now, we're getting ready to do our, our exam, so we need to make sure that we prepare the client and the environment. When you go into the room, you need to make sure they understand why you're there, that you are going to be doing a physical exam. Okay? So when you go in the room, you're going to explain the purpose of your visit. You're going to make sure that they've gone to the bathroom, especially your first time. When you start doing your physical exams, when you go to the hospital in a couple of weeks, you're going to take a lot longer than a nurse who's been caring for patients for 15, 16 years. It's going to take you a while. So make sure they've gone to the bathroom, make sure that they're warm, and make sure that you provide privacy. Okay? You don't want to have the door standing wide open if you're going to be exposing areas of their body to the same. Okay? We follow the rule least invasive to most invasive and also least painful to most painful. If you're examining someone who has a broken leg, you're not going to be poking and feeling on that broken leg first. Because if you put someone in pain, are they really going to be able to pay attention to the rest of the exam? No. <laughs> no. no. They're not going to focus on anything that you're doing from now on out. So you really need to make sure that you go from not only least invasive to most invasive, but least painful to most painful is what you end with. All right. You're also going to make sure that you have all the equipment to do your exam with you, that you're not in and out of that room. If you forget something the first time, that's okay, but make sure that you get whatever you need before you come back in there. You don't want to be in and out, in and out, in and out. And that you're positioning the patient in a, in a position that they're comfortable where you can get the most data. When can you get a lot of your assessment done? When is when are ideal times to get your assessment done? What do you think? Think about it as a CNA. When you're when you're what? When you're bathing. Them. When you're bathing them is a great time to do it. Can't you when you're giving them a bath inspect their skin? Assess their skin? Yeah. What else? What about their mouth? When could I look at their mouth and their tongue when you're feeding when you're feeding them or doing mouth care okay what about um, what can I get while they are while I'm walking them to the bathroom okay you could do, you could get samples but you can also assess their ability to balance to ambulate to walk their gait okay so a lot of these assessment techniques you can get during everyday care. If you're having to feed a patient, you can see how well they swallow, how well they chew. Okay. When you walk in the room and you say, my name is Emily and I'm going to be your student nurse for today, and they say, well, hello Emily, my name is so-and-so and, and it's nice to meet you. Well, then you know that they can speak without slurring, that they understood what you're asking them, so their cognition's intact. You know, to a point. So there's a lot of things that you can do during a physical assessment that you can get during your everyday care. Also, making sure that you you um, think about infection control techniques. If and we're going to talk about that as we go along. You need to make sure that you wear gloves at the appropriate time. If you're reaching in someone's mouth, please have gloves on. If you're you know palpating their their parts of their skin where there's an open gaping wound, then you need to make sure that you have gloves or a gown on. So whatever infection control is for that patient, you need to make sure that you follow that protocol. Okay, let's talk about different age groups. This is my little boy when he was a baby. The Ben. He's not that cute now, no, he's still cute. He's just, he's just eight. Um, he's just a typical eight-year-old. Um, he wore it for his first day of school yesterday. He had to wear his Life of the Party shirt. So. 
Anyway, okay, so assessing the age groups. When you're assessing a child, and you will go to pediatrics with me twice, um, so you will get a chance, an opportunity to assess children, you need to make sure that there's always a parent present, unless there's a reason that that parent can't be in the room. And you will have situations like that. We will have children who are abuse cases. And if it's a parent who's suspected of doing that, then of course they can't be in the room at the time. So that's the only time that you would not want a parent in the room. Other than that, parents need to be present. Um, and when you're thinking about developmental ages, of course, you want to make sure that you make it fun. Um, we have, uh, the only thing that I think those yellow isolation stethoscopes are good for is to give a child when you're trying to do an assessment because you can't hear a thing out of them. So those I give out all the time to these kids and let them listen to their own heart. Let them listen to your heart. They think that's really neat. Um, anything that you do to them, you can do to their baby doll if they have one uh, there with them. So you want to make sure that it's more fun and play than an actual procedure. Older adults, you also need to make sure that they are that they are comfortable, that they are covered. Older adults tend to get colder quicker, so you want to make sure that it's warm in the room. And please, uh, you know, we talked about avoid stereotyping. You want to avoid stereotyping with older adults as well. Don't assume that everybody who is above the age of 70 is deaf. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Do not walk in a room and start yelling at them, um, or that they're blind, or that they have Alzheimer's. Okay, everybody who said my, my little grandmother lived to be 92 and she was very alert until she, until she passed away. So don't assume that just because that they're older that they are, that they have those typical problems. So avoid stereotyping. Okay. All right. So those are some of the differences in the age groups. All right. Now we're going to talk about our little, our skills. Our skills of assessment and this is going to be your toolbox if you think about a toolbox these are the equipment that you have to assess your patient the first thing is inspection and this is probably the easiest thing to do um, is the process of observation <coughs> inspection is the process of observation it's walking into the room have you how many of you actually work as a CNA currently Okay, good, a lot of you. So how, haven't you noticed that when you just walk into the door, you can tell a lot about your patient, can't you? You can tell whether they're confused or they're alert. You can tell if they have had a bath or not. You can tell whether or not, um, what kind of mood they're in at the time. What else can you tell just by observing your patient? Hmm? If they're in pain or not. Think. What position they are in the bed, the positioning that they have themselves in. The thing about inspection, of course, is that we have to know normal to know abnormal. So we're going to talk about that as we go throughout the different systems. We're going to know what's abnormal and what's normal. Okay, you want to make sure when you're doing inspection of any body part that you have good lighting. I was a third shift nurse for a long time, and third shift nurses have a really bad habit of doing an assessment without turning on the light. <laughs> and because um, the patient's asleep, well, it's good to a point because but you can't see, and if you can't see without the light on, then it's hard to tell if their skin color has changed. Um, if they have blueness you know, <coughs> around their lips or anything like that. So you have to make sure that you have good lighting. You're positioning and exposing them as you need to. You don't, of course, undrape them or undress them completely and leave them laying nude in the bed. That is not a good thing. Making sure if you need additional light that you have it. Pin lights are a great tool to have. Those little tiny flashlights that you can buy, those are okay to use as well. Um, anything to inspect and making sure that you pay attention to detail. Don't hurry through your exam. Um, making sure that you're really, really looking at all the different areas. So inspection is your easiest tool in your toolbox. Um, one of the easiest things to use. Palpation is your next tool in your toolbox. 
is the sense of touch. Palpation, when you're palpating something, you're touching something. The most sensitive part of your hand is the palmar surface and the pads of the finger, fingers. Okay, so that is the most sensitive part of your hand. So when you're palpating, you're using the palmar surface of your hand or your fingertips. Unless you're feeling temperature, then you use the back of your hand. Okay, a lot of people want to do this number and say, oh, they feel hot. Not what they're feeling is the heat from their own palmar surface. So when you're feeling temperature, even if you're feeling temperature of an extremity, not just a face, that's what we typically associate feeling for temperature. But if you're feeling for the temperature of an extremity, then you're using the back of your hand. Okay? Um, the capillary surfaces are not as close to the skin. Okay? If you're feeling for texture, you're feeling for position, you can palpate size of something. If it's a knot or a nodule, you can feel the size and the consistency. There are two different methods of palpating. This is a picture of light palpation versus deep palpation. Light palpation is what you will be doing. Light palpation determines the, the uh, areas of tenderness. You can determine structure. You're not going very deep. You're only going about a half an inch or a centimeter when you're palpating or pushing on something. Like if you're palpating the abdomen with your fingertips, like in this picture, you're not going to push very deep. It's so only about half an inch or a centimeter. Deep palpation is used to examine deeper organs, such as the base or the edge of the liver. The problem with deep palpation is that if you're not adequately trained on how to do deep palpation, then you can injure someone. So deep palpation is not something you're going to be doing as a student. That's something that um, physicians usually do or practitioners, nurse practitioners. With deep palpation, they are pressing in as much as two inches, one to two inches. Okay, has anybody ever had their liver palpated? Yeah, and it kind of hurts when you palpate, palpate the edge of like a liver. You know, they're having to really push deep down and feel the base of that liver. How many, how many of you girls have had a baby? You know how they, when they feel for the fundus and they press down, really, that's deep palpation. You're, you're palpating the edge of the, fun, the fundus or the uterus. Okay, so light palpation versus deep palpation. Okay, the next tool in your toolbox is percussion. Percussion is done by tapping the body with the fingertips. Indirect percussion is one thing that you're going to be doing mostly. With indirect percussion, and we're going to look at that and just I'm going to flip this slide and we'll, we can come back to it if we need it. Oh, it's not there. Hmm. Well, there's two types of percussion, indirect and direct percussion. Indirect is striking the body using your fingertips while the other hand is laying up against the surface. So, for example, if I put my finger, let's see, we'll put my, this hand right here on my chest mm -hmm. surface. I'm going to use my fingertip and I'm going to actually tap on my own hand. I'm not actually hitting the person's body. That's indirect percussion. Okay. And the reason we use indirect percussion is so that we don't injure somebody. I mean, if you're tapping and beating on their chest wall or their abdomen, you could actually bruise them. So you, indirect is the art of just indirectly tapping or percussing using um, this indirect method. Direct, of course, percussion is actually striking the body with your own fingers. Okay, there's different sounds that you're going to hear. Okay. For example, lung tissue, if you're percussing over lung tissue, it's going to be high-pitched or, excuse me, high intensity and low pitched because it's what? What would be the lungs, a normal lung is air filled. Okay? Can you repeat that? Mm -hmm. What is 
Direct percussion is when you actually, we don't ever use it as nurses, we use indirect so we don't injure someone. Um, but you can, direct percussion would just be if you're really making sure that you're hearing what you think you're hearing, you're actually striking something. Okay, that too. Yes, darling. You always got a question. What did you say the, the sounds work? The sounds work. Okay, the first one is, well, there's going to be a lot of different sounds. And I haven't right. given you all of them. But we're talking about lung tissue, okay, low-pitched and high intensity. What does intensity mean? means the strength of the sound. The sound of a, lung, a normal lung tissue is going to be air-filled. So if you, for example, it would sound like you tapping on a balloon that's been blown up. Okay. <clears throat> Tapping on a balloon that's been blown up. Whereas a solid surface, like a liver, for example, something that's solid, a solid organ, okay, would have a very soft intensity. It would be hard to hear. I mean, there's not going to be any fluid or air in it. It's going to feel like you're striking like the table. Okay, so if you tap the table, that's what it's going to sound like. Okay, this is probably the least used skill. And as students, you're never going to do this. I don't ever do it. I very ever use percussion because it's hard to tell what you're really hearing. Now, if for example, they have infection in their lungs. Maybe they have congestive heart failure and they have fluid building up in their lungs. Where that, where it was sounding like just an air-filled balloon, now it's going to sound more like hitting the table because there's something in there. There's, there's fluid in there that's blocking that air sound. You see where there would be a difference in sound? Your book goes into detail on all the different types of sounds that you hear, and we're not gonna, I'm not going to test you on all that because it's such a hard thing to do. All right, the favorite thing everybody loves to do is get that stethoscope out and auscultate. Okay, so your, your next tool in your toolbox is auscultation. And that's, of course, listening to the sounds using your stethoscope. Now, there are two parts to your stethoscope, and I did not bring mine with me today because I knew we wouldn't get to this too, too far into it. But there's two parts to your stethoscope. And so if you have, I'm going to use, I'll use Lakeisha's stethoscope. Hopefully, and she, she remembers me telling this, there's a diaphragm and there's a bell. Okay? If you have a stethoscope that does not have two parts to it, let me know. Some of the newer stethoscopes, say that they have, they have the diaphragm that if you push a little bit harder, you can, uh, it acts as a bell on it. Um, we'll look at it and, just, and determine. The bell is used to hear deeper sounds, okay, low pitch sounds, such as murmurs, heart murmurs. The diaphragm is used to hear higher pitch sounds like lung sounds or bowel sounds. Now every year I find somebody who does not know this. If you're ever listening with your stethoscope and you can't hear anything, make sure that you turn it because it does click and turn. You can actually turn off a side. I don't know, a lot of people don't know that. Every stethoscope will do that. So if you're listening and you can't hear a word, then turn it and click it, and then probably you'll magically hear something. <laughs> okay. If you have a stethoscope that has two diaphragms on it, you need to look in your kit that came with your stethoscope and replace the second diaphragm, the small diaphragm, with the bell. Okay. You don't need two diaphragms. All right. Okay. That's the parts of the stethoscope. All right, you want to listen with your stethoscope on naked skin. It drives me bananas when I go to the doctor's office and they are 
trying to get my blood pressure through a sweater. All right, that is not proper technique. Okay, proper technique is listening through on naked skin. All right, you also need to make sure that when you're auscultating that it's quiet in the room. If there's a lot of chattering or if the TV is on or if they're on the phone, you're not going to be able to hear adequately. So it's okay to not rudely ask them to turn the TV down or ask any family member that's in the room if they can step out for just a second while you do your, your assessment and then they can come back in. That's okay. You're not, you're not going to offend anybody. When you're auscultating, and I've got this in bold because this is something you are going to need to remember for a future, more formal setting, such as when we take a test. Okay, something you really need to remember, that when you're auscultation, auscultating, it should be carried out last of all the tools in your toolbox, except for the abdomen. The reason for that, we want to listen to the abdomen first before you start palpating on it or before you start, you know, percussing on the abdomen because it's not going to, you're not going to have true sounds. If you're beating on the abdomen and palpating and feeling on it, you're stirring up sounds that weren't there to begin with, okay? So the abdominal assessment is the only time that you will actually listen with your stethoscope first before you do anything else. Everything else you're going to inspect and palpate and percuss before you auscultate. So the abdomen is the only exception to the rule. Okay. All right. Olfaction. This is one of the most unfortunate of our tools in our toolboxes most of the time. It's our sense of smell. And uh, you can tell a lot by the sense of smell. I, you know, anybody who has ever smelled sepia can tell it a mile away. It is a very distinct odor. A GI bleed, very distinct odor. A urinary tract infection. You know, you walk in the room and woo, it you know, explodes your way. You can smell that urine. You know exactly what's going on. A urinary tract infection. Someone who has diabetic ketoacidosis, where their blood sugar is extremely, really high. They have a fruity smell to their breath. It's very acetone smelling. They almost smell drunk. That's what they smell like. It smells like alcohol. And that's, that's what it is. It's the alcohol, the ketones that are boiling, is blowing off. Um, so our sense of olfaction can tell us a whole lot um, whether or not they have a rotten body part or a tooth or something. Um, olfaction is something that we use a lot. Okay, you're going to begin your assessment with a general survey. That's the very first thing you're going to do, general survey. And in the general survey, the first thing you're going to do is their general appearance and their mental status. When you're looking at someone, when you're using the inspection, the tool of inspection, you're looking at their gender, their race, their age, there are any signs of distress. You can also tell when you walk in the room, you can inspect their posture, their gait, if they walk into the room, any body movements, hygiene, all those things you can get by inspecting their general appearance. You can also get their mental status at this time, some of their mental status. You can tell whether or not they really have the clue where they are. Okay. Vital signs, that's something you learned in your CNA program. We're going to talk about the different vital signs in a little bit and actually what they mean. Height and weight, of course, when you're getting someone's height, they're removing their shoes, they stand straight, you're measuring from the top of their head to their heel. If you're measuring the length of a, of a baby, which is the same thing as the height, one of the easiest things to do is to lay them down, stretch them out, and take a pen and mark, and then they can, they can pick, be picked up, and then you can measure your two marks because babies will not lift still. You're going to kick and squirm and move. So you want to make sure that you take a pen and mark where they lay and then measure that. 
weight, when you're checking someone's weight, you want to make sure that you're measuring them either in the beginning of the day, you measure a baby naked or with a dry diaper, and you want to make sure that you're measuring them on the same scale that you used to measure them the first time, because scales do change. Skin fold thickness is something that you will not be doing in the hospital, but it is something that's done on occasion in the doctor's office. They use a tool called calipers. You ever heard of a caliper? It looks like mm -hmm. the inch. The skin, C-A-L-I-P-E-R-S, calipers. Head circumference is not only done on infants. You may do head circumference on someone who's had um, brain surgery, or if you suspect that they're their head is swelling because of fluid build up. You can do their head circumference. You take a tape measure, you measure from the eyebrows all the way around to the back of the head, protuberant to the back of the head. Chest circumference, you measure from the nipple line all the way around the back, making sure there's no indentation. When else besides a child would you check chest circumference? If they've had surgery, COPD. What about congestive heart failure? If they have fluid building up in their chest or in their lungs, congestive heart failure would be a good time. So you may do chest circumference a lot. You said from the neck to from the nipples all the way around to the back. Now, the way that I have set up this lecture is by concepts. Because remember, we're a concept-based curriculum. Okay? <clears throat> so, the first concept we're going to talk about is thermoregulation. And that's just a fancy word for temperature. Alright? So, we'll start talking about temperature. I'll give you just a smidge of a break and then it really has to be. Okay. Before we wrap up. Okay, thermoregulation. You know how to take a temperature, but what we're going to talk about is why we do what we do and what we do with what we find. Okay? This should be a review. Body temperature is heat produced minus heat lost. You remember that from somewhere? Anatomy? Did y'all talk about things like this? Biology? Any of this? No, maybe sort of, kind of. It's foggy. Okay, well, body temperature is heat produced minus heat lost. Okay, regulation is the balance between the two. We want to make sure that we stay balanced, and that's also called thermoregulation. So we're regulating the temperature. Heat production, when we're talking about heat production, a lot of things cause us to produce heat. Our metabolic rate which decreases as we age. That's why older people tend to get cold really easily. They don't produce the same amount of heat that we do when we're younger. When is another time in your life that temperature is different? For women especially. Menopause, they go through a change in their, oops, a change in their metabolic rate. Okay. Muscular activity, if you are exercising a lot, you're gonna produce more heat. Um, there are two substances, thyroxine and epinephrine, produced by, in the brain, the hypothalamus, that can cause, they stimulate the metabolic rate. And the temperature effect, which is essentially a fever, we're going to look at that in a minute, what a fever actually is. And then heat loss. All those terms sound familiar? Radiation, conduction, convection, evaporation, you know, remember those? Yeah, maybe sort of. Do you agree that behavioral things that we do can affect the amount of heat that we produce and lose? Okay. If we bundle ourselves up in blankets and turn the heat up in the room, of course, that's going to cause our temperature to go up. If we're in a very cold environment, if, if we 
lose our vines for a short period of time, we decide to climb Mount Everest, and we freeze ourselves to death and start losing fingertips and toe tips and whatever. And of course, we're decreasing our temperature. And then there's sometimes that um, we can't help it. Heat waves, for example, that's not something that, that occurs for us, but it does cause a change in the temperature. Okay. Several years ago, um, about nine, ten years ago, I was in Italy for two weeks, and there was a um, heat wave going on, if you remember this. It was going on all over Europe, and there were people dying left and right because they, they don't have air conditioning over there. And so in their typical, they wear a lot of long sleeves, long pants. And so um, they were not used to that kind of heat. It was, it was a pretty miserable time of year. So you have to be very careful. They always warn us on TV to check on the elderly and all that whenever it gets really, really hot because a lot of people don't know that they're getting as hot as they are. So heat loss and heat production are really important concepts to remember. Okay, we've talked about age affects body temperature. <coughs> we know that the elderly, of course, get really, really cold. What about newborns? How does their body temperature, how does their body temperature regulate? Where do they lose heat? Through okay. their head. Through their head. So we really need to make sure that as a newborn leaves that nice warm environment, that they do have a hat on their head so that they don't lose heat. Temperature regulation is pretty unstable for puberty. It does normalize as we reach adulthood. And then as we become older, older adults tend to, again, we talk about this, lose heat or not produce heat as readily. We mentioned exercise, hormone level we talked about. Circadian rhythms, those of you who work third shift know that about 4 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden you get really cold. Mm -hmm. um, so our temperature is at its lowest <coughs> between 4 and 6 a.m. There's a little, this is a nice little drawing of temperature in the time of day. And it's at its highest about noon, it steadily rises through the day, it's at its highest about noon, and then it starts to decrease slowly, and it's at its lowest between four and six. So it is really true that if you work for a shift and you get really, really cold, that's, that's because our body is doing that. It's not because somebody turned the air conditioner on. It really is the truth. Stress. Anybody get really, really hot this morning before the test? Yeah, stress can cause your temperature to rise. And of course, in the environment, we mentioned that the environment is definitely affects our body temperature. Okay. Let's talk about this slide and then we'll take a quick, quick break. Temperature alterations. Fever. What is a fever? The fancy word for fever is pyrexia. You ever heard of that? Pyrexia. It's when heat loss is unable to keep up with heat production. And we're producing more than um, what we're able to lose. So let's talk about this. And a lot of people don't know this. This is kind of an interesting process. The word pyrogen, there's a fancy word called pyrogen, <coughs> and a pyrogen is either a bacteria or a virus, okay? Pyrogens are bacteria or viruses that affect us, okay? Now, there are three phases to a fever process, and you've seen them in yourselves or in your children or in your family members, but you've never probably really realized what they're what's going on. The first phase of the fever process is when you have been exposed to something. You've been exposed to a pyrogen, a bacteria, or a virus. Okay? The body says, oh no, 
I've been exposed to this pyrogen, now I've got to do something. So there are hormones that are released in the body that trigger, what is the temperature regulating center of the brain? The hypothalamus. The hypothalamus. It triggers the hypothalamus triggers the hypothalamus to raise the body temperature. body temperature. Now why is the body raising the temperature? It's trying to kill the pyrogens, isn't it? It's trying to kill it. So there are times that fevers are, well all the time, fevers are a good thing. Fevers are not a bad thing. Fevers are a good thing. And as parents we get really, really anxious and what do we want to do? We see that temperature going up and we want to automatically slap some Tylenol or Motrin in, these, in our children, don't we? And all we are doing is prolonging the illness. That's all we're doing, because we're making it last longer. But it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to see your baby miserable. And so it's easier to go ahead and give them Motrin and Tylenol. But if we would be brave, and we wouldn't give them something, the body would actually kill it off a lot quicker. Okay, so it's raising the body temperature to this new set point. Okay, the second phase, and that set point is whatever type of bacteria or virus it is, the set point is whatever it's going to take to kill it. So, for example, a cold virus may not need as high of a temperature to kill it as meningitis, of the bacteria that causes meningitis. Okay. So body's going to recognize and it's going to say, oh, this is staph aureus. Well, I know that staph is going to take a temperature of 102 to kill it. And so I'm going to raise the body temperature to that point so it'll kill it. It's pretty, pretty amazing that it can do that. Okay. So the second phase is that it's producing and conserving heat. It produces and conserves so it holds on to it. Heat. How do you know when it's trying to get to that set point? How do you know when your temperature's going up? You start to do something. Shiver. You start to chill. You start to chill. So these phases are called the chill phases. A lot of people refer to them as the chill phases. Because what you're doing is you are shivering. Okay? Now, what does everybody want to do? They see themselves, they see these people shivering and they want to slap the blankets on and they want to turn the temperature up in the room. I had one this weekend that did the same thing. The child had pyelonephritis and that mama, you would walk in the room, you'd open the door and the temperature would just go whoosh. I mean, you start sweating the minute you walk in the door because it was so hot in there. What, what was that doing? All it was doing is making it worse, wasn't it? It was making her temperature worse. That shivering, that chilling, is the body's way of increasing muscle activity. And what did we talk about just a minute ago? Muscle activity does what? Produces heat. So that chilling, that shivering, is producing, is producing muscle activity to increase the body temperature. So that's called the chill phase. That's helping it reach that set point and maintain it. We want to stay and serve heat. <coughs> Okay, now, the third phase is when the cause is removed, okay? You've finally taken enough antibiotics that the bacteria or the virus is dead, okay? The hypothalamus says, whew, I've done my job. It's going to drop. It's going to start dropping the temperature, and we're going to have heat loss. And what happens when a fever <coughs> finally breaks? You sweat. And so the heat is lost by evaporation. Okay, the cause is removed. 
and heat loss occurs. Usually by evaporation. Now, a lot of people confuse this third phase with given Tylenol or Motrin. That's not this. This is when it's actually gone. The actual pyrogen is gone. When do we intervene? We tend to get right here. We tend to get nervous because we see our sweet little child, our little angel, miserable with flushed cheeks and their temperature is 101 and we give them some Motrin. Well, we're prolonging this third phase. All we're doing is masking it. We're not taking the cause away. It's not doing a thing cause. All it's doing is masking that temperature. It's bringing the temperature back down and then what's it going to have to do again? It's going to have to reach that set point all over again because we've intervened and we brought it down. And it hasn't, it hasn't been conserved, hasn't conserved enough heat for long enough to do anything. So all we've done is we're prolonging it. Now, am I advocating not medicating your children? No, not because they're miserable, and it's hard as a mother or father to see your children being miserable. But we need to know instinctively, when you see a temperature of 99 or 100, don't give Tylenol or Motrin. Don't, don't, until the temperature gets above 101. That's when you medicate. And you're gonna, you'll have pediatricians telling you that all the time. 101 or above, then you can medicate. Anything less than that, you need to leave it alone because the body is trying to do its thing. It's trying to do its own thing. Okay? So the third phase is something, you've given enough antibiotics to finally kill the bacteria or if it's a virus, the body has finally killed it off by the fever. Does everybody understand that? Does it kind of make sense to you? You kind of see it and you know? Okay. Two terms, hyperthermia, of course, is being too hot. Hyperthermia is being too hot. Heat stroke and heat exhaustion. And then hypothermia is being too cold. Let's look at hyperthermia.
you can actually die from heat stroke because the body is so depleted of sodium and potassium and fluid that they can actually die if you're not intervening very quickly. So the biggest difference between the two is that sweating. Heat exhaustion, they can still sweat. Heat stroke, they have gone past that point. Everybody see that? And then, of course, hypothermia. I don't have a nice picture for that, but hypothermia is frostbite. That's one example of it. Frostbite, ice crystals form actually inside the cell of the skin. It freezes inside the cell and they die off. Now, there are times when we intentionally drop the body temperature, such as surgery. You go to surgery next semester with Ms. Walker, you'll notice that the OR suites are cold. They're very cold. And the reason for that is because we want to slow down the body's metabolism. We want to slow down the blood flow. Um, so we intentionally give, put them in a hypothermic state. But most of the time, you don't want to be hypothermic. Okay? All right, if you need to get potty, take about five minutes. Quick, quick break. Don't wander out to the edge of the road to smoke. Question. We want it to be in a decent range. How do we check temperature? We have oral thermometers. We have rectal and axillary. And then tympanic. You know, tympanic membrane is a wonderful way to check temperature if they don't have something stuck in their ears. And we usually do that with children a lot. They can have wax filled up. They may have a green bean or a bead or a car stuck in that ear. And then you can't get an accurate reading. So tympanic membrane is okay as long as they have a free and clear, free and clear access to their tympanic membrane. Of course, oral, rectal, and axillary temperatures. Um, rectal generally is a degree higher than oral. Axillary is generally a degree lower than oral. So we add a degree. Unless, you know, we got the nice thermometers now that will do it for us. We can change it to axillary. Okay? The old way of using the old thermometers are mercury and glass. And I leave this up here because we still do have some people with glass thermometers with the mercury in it. The mercury will rise in the presence of heat. Electronic is mostly what we see now. And then you do see some disposables. We use those in our isolation rooms. Disposable electronic thermometers. Okay. There's a lot of different types out there. I'm not real thrilled with the pacifier thermometers or the kind that you stick on their head. Have you ever seen those? Yeah, they put a strip on their head and it changes color. I'm not real overwhelmed by those. But uh, the old way is the best way. You're going to learn these. These are some nursing diagnoses that you're going to learn to use that, were, that apply to temperature. And I put them on here just so that you will know them for the future. You can kind of refer back. All right, let's talk about tissue integrity. Tissue integrity. All right. When we are assessing for tissue, we're looking at a lot of different things. And I'm going to put some terms up on the board because I want you to know some of these terms. We know what normal looks like, but we need to know the terms for abnormal. So you're going to start being start having to use some of these more fancier terms. When you're looking at color, you want to tell, see whether or not it's uniform all over the body. Is it the same? Is it the same in your hands as it is in your feet? All right, so some odd colors, some different colors. The word cyanosis is a blue discoloration. That is usually a very bad thing. Okay, best seen in the lips and the nails. There is a condition called central cyanosis. 
that is the end sign. That is the sign that right before they die, central cyanosis is an extremely bad sign. That means that their tongue and their, and their mucosal membranes are blue. That is it. There's nothing you can be done at that point if they have central cyanosis. Okay. Jaundice. Jaundice is yellow. They kind of glow like pumpkins. Okay. Jaundice is a uh, increased level of bilirubin in the in the body. We mostly associate jaundice with newborns, but it can be adults, people who have liver disease, liver failure, or who have a blocked bile duct. Maybe they have a gallstone that has blocked the bile duct and all that nice bilirubin that uh, should be excreted. You know, bilirubin is what makes your stool brown and your urine yellow. I don't know if you knew that or not. But bilirubin, if it is not excreted properly through the stool or through the urine, it builds up in the tissues and it causes a yellow discoloration in the skin. So it's not just babies, it's adults who have liver disease, gallbladder disease. Okay. Erythema. Erythema. is redness, redness, and then pallor, pallor is pale, just being pale. And there's some other, quote, colors you can look at. Bruising, if someone bruises a lot, that would be a change in the color of the skin. But a bruise is different, even though it's a blue or a purple color, you can't call that cyanosis. There's a difference there. Okay. Moisture, feeling for moisture. And what are we using? What are those tools in the toolbox are we, are we using? What do you think? Is it inspection, palpation, percussion, or auscultation? Palpation. palpation. This is all palpation. Inspection and palpation. Okay? So we're palpating the skin. Is it dry or is it moist? The temperature of the skin. Do you remember what part of the hand I said we're going to use? The back of the hand to feel the temperature. The back of the hand to feel the temperature. It should be warm not hot. The texture of the skin, is it smooth or is it rough? Thick or thin, tight or supple? Indurated, the term indurated means hard. There's a hardened area. Turgor. When you're feeling for skin turgor, does everybody know how to check the turgor of the skin? You pinch the skin. Okay, right, you pinch it. It should be elastic. It should snap back into place. If it stays, if you pinch the skin and it stays, that's called tinting. T-E-N-T-I-N-G. Tinting. And that's an indication of dehydration, tinting skin. When you pinch it and it stays put, you still see a tint there. It's called tinting. When you're checking for turgor on a newborn, you're going to use their abdomen, not their arm or their hand. For a newborn, you'd use their abdomen. An older person, an older adult, you use the skin over their sternum. The skin over their sternum. Because what, what, is, what does an older person's hand and arm look like? Their skin's loose to begin with, isn't it? So it's not going to give you a good indication of whether or not they have dehydration or not. So 
an older adult over their sternum, an infant over their abdomen, and then anybody else. You can use their arm, their hand. Okay, vascularity, you're looking to tell whether or not there are any um, uh, broken veins or vessels, spider veins. You're looking to see whether or not the skin is swollen. Edema means the skin is stretched, it's awfully shiny. We're going to talk about pitting edema later on. Okay, and then do they have any lesions? Lesions. Now let's talk about lesions. Let's talk about the different types of lesions. There are primary skin lesions and there are secondary skin lesions. And I believe there's a picture in your book of different types of nasty looking skin. Okay. So let's talk about lesions. Primary skin lesions are lesions that appear because something has happened, there's a change in the environment. You brushed up against poison ivy, poison oak. Okay, there's a change in your skin's environment. A macule is a primary skin lesion. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna give you an example of each of these things. A macule is a freckle or a birthmark. A papule is a solid lesion such as a wart. A pustule is exactly what it sounds like. It's a pus field. An example of a pustule though can be impetigo. Anybody ever seen my impetigo? Mm -hmm. Children are the world's worst to get impetigo because they have something that starts out like a um, mosquito bite and they scratch and scratch and scratch and scratch and scratch and it becomes infected. Mm -hmm. And that's called that's impetigo. That's what it is. So it's a pus field lesion. A cyst is fluid field. And a cyst and a wheel are very similar. So they're both fluid field. Hives are an example of a wheel, which you consider a wheel. And then something that not a lot of you actually have seen anymore. A vesicle is chicken pox. Anybody, who had chicken pox in here? Just out of curiosity. Well, a lot of you did. Okay. Eventually, I'm going to be teaching long enough to have a class where they can all be vaccinated. Nobody's going to have had the chicken pox before. All right, a skin lesion, a secondary skin lesion, is a result of the, the primary lesion becoming infected or trauma, or something happened to it, it was traumatized. Okay. Atrophy is when the skin becomes paper-like. It loses elasticity, it loses its texture, it's dry and paper-like. A keloid is excessive scar tissue, such as the surgical incision. They had surgery, but the, the scar didn't heal well. It's not a flat scar. Anybody ever seen things like that? The scar's raised. There's excessive scar, scar tissue. Okay. An ulcer is loss of, a, of, the, of the skin, loss of the skin, it de deep down into the dermis, into the connective tissue. Anybody ever seen a decubitus ulcer? Those of you who worked in nursing homes or in assisted living, I'm sure you've seen your share. Decubitus ulcers are pretty deep, <coughs> stinky. 
A scar is a little different than a keloid. A scar is more healed. It's more flat. It's an area of uh, connective tissue that is healed. And then a fissure. I always like to think of fissure in the winter time. You know how you get cracks in your lips, like right here in the corners in the winter, your skin becomes real chapped or your lips become real chapped. Or athlete's foot is an example of a fissure when the skin between the toes cracks. Those are fissures. questions about skin. Now remember what I said, you may need to make sure that you wear gloves because I don't know about you, but I don't want to be feeling on pus filled skin. So when you're feeling around on this stuff, you need to make sure that you have gloves on. And we're not just, there's skin under the hair. So you're taking your hands and you're putting them in people's hair. You know, there can be things living up there. <laughs> So you need to make sure that you have gloves on, that you wash your hands appropriately. You know, you're looking for lice and whatever else could be up there at the time um, when you're inspecting the texture as well, integrity. All right? All right, you're dead. You're not even focused hardly on me. So we're going to stop there. We'll pick